Let's talk about two topics, um, spanning tree and link eggs, and they're, they're kind of related in an interesting way. We'll explore that. Um, a note about this video, uh, we're going to really just glance over the surface of these topics. There's no way we can get into really the details of all the different spanning tree variants and types and timers and all that, or uh, the same thing with link eggs. Um, there's a lot to it and there's different standards. So we're going to just be doing a general overview. So you're kind of conversational on these topics. So fair warning, lots more depth uh, here. Let's talk about spanning tree first. So imagine we have uh, two switches, switch A uh, over here on the left and switch B, and we want them to communicate reliably. And reliably is kind of the key word here. So we decide to connect these switches with two links. Makes sense, right? So if one link uh, fails, say link A, you'll still have link B for these switches to communicate over and you can repair link A and get everything back working. This is kind of a best practice, right? So when you care about redundancy of a connection, you know, from one building to another, you want to run a couple different links. But we have a problem. So uh, Alice wants to send Alice over here on the left a message to Bob. Knows his IP address, Bob's IP address, but not his MAC address, uh, layer two address, right? Layer three IP, layer two MAC address. So she crafts an ARP request. That's the address resolution resolution protocol. And that request, because we don't know, you know, Bob's MAC address is a broadcast sent to everybody by definition of a broadcast. So that frame gets set and hit the switch. Switch A receives that broadcast frame and sees that it's a broadcast and does what it should do, follows its logic and forwards that frame out to all of its other interfaces. So notice not the interface that received the broadcast broadcast on, interface three, but out to interface one and two. And those are these red arrows here. So this is the correct uh, behavior for broadcast packets and also for unknown unicast packets when a switch doesn't have the destination MAC address in its MAC address table, it'll also treat that packet kind of with broadcast handling. It'll just send it out to everybody in hopes that somebody will know where that packet should go. So, the broadcast is sent out both ports and switch B receives that broadcast frame on its ports. It actually receives two of them. Remember link A or port one and link B port two. So two frames were sent. Switch receives two copies of that broadcast. And now, because switch B's received a broadcast, it sends those two broadcasts out all the other ports besides the ports that uh, it received the particular packet on. So one of those broadcasts comes in here and is sent out the other link and sent over to Bob and Another broadcast comes in here and is sent out link B, so link A to link B, right back at switch A. You're probably starting to see the problem here. Switch A receives the broadcast frame on port one and port two, two copies again. Uh, but because the frame is a broadcast frame, it follows its logic and decides to send the frame out to all ports besides the ones that the frame was received on. And this process, because in the layer two header in ethernet, there's no time to live value, a concept we haven't covered yet, but there's, there's, there's no aging out process. This will happen over and over and over again until the switch is unplugged or runs out of resources. And even worse, the switch will do this as fast as it possibly can for every broadcast. Literally, we'll take networks down this way, a broadcast loop. So introducing spanning tree, all that to get here. Spanning tree was invented to solve this looping problem. Its whole job is to remove the loops from the network topology. Um, so there's only one 
active path to any destination at the same time. Imagine a tree with the trunk and branches, and there's one big trunk and little branches to all the places. That's kind of what spanning tree di tries to do through an algorithm. Make it so there's only one path. And in here, you see in our little example, spanning trees blocked port two on switch B. So now this link is inactive and link A is the only one that's active. Now notice just by blocking that one port that deactivates the utility of this link. The link is still up, it's still functioning and you'd see blinking lights on the switch but, but that link's not in use. So let's talk about how spanning tree creates this loop free topology. What its algorithm kind of looks like. And again, we're going to just glaze over the surface here. There's a lot more complexity and intricacy of the different types of frames and whatnot. But to begin the process of creating a loop free topology, uh, spanning tree first elects what they call a root device. And I like to think of this as the trunk of the spanning tree. A tree has one trunk that's planted in the ground. We call this, uh, in spanning tree terminology, the root bridge. Uh, the root bridge, the, the, specifically the bridge part, is the name of a device that was a precursor to a switch. It was like a two-port switch. Uh, so it's kind of an old-school term. You could, you could easily um, call it the root switch. But you'll see root bridge used everywhere. It's kind of the standard spanning tree term. So root bridge, think of it as a root switch, base of that tree. So let's talk about the spanning tree root bridge election. There's a little election that occurs, just like on voting day. Um, each switch is given a priority value. Uh, there's defaults uh, programmed into the switch, maybe 32768 is the default priority like we have here, but an administrator can go in and lower the priority of a switch. So that's what we did here for switch C, we lowered its priority and a lower priority is actually a better value. So all of the switches in the network send out packets called BPDUs or bridge protocol data units. We talked about root bridges and bridge protocol. So you can see they like the word bridges a lot. Um, and that, that packet amongst other things includes the priority of that switch and the MAC address of that switch in case the priorities tie. We call this combination of data the bridge ID, a combination of a priority value and a MAC address. All right. Uh, and what happens here is that the lowest priority wins the election. And the other switches respect that switch, hopefully, uh, if everything's functioning normally, as the root. And they back off and they say, nope, I'm not the root anymore. Uh, I should say that every switch, when it boots up, wants to think it's the root until it loses the election. They all start thinking, hey, I'm the root. Uh, if there's a tie in priority values, as happens sometimes, uh, you generally don't want that to happen. You want to set your priority on your root switch. But if there's a tie, the lowest MAC address wins. In this case, we've truncated MAC addresses. We know that's normally a 12-digit uh, field there, but I just have AA and DD and BB. So notice, normally this would be the highest MAC address, the highest value, but it's the lowest priority. Priority wins in this case. The lowest priority wins. Uh, if all three of these priorities were the same, all say 32768, this device would actually become the root bridge because it has the lowest MAC address. So now our new root bridge, switch C, begins to send out BPDUs, bridge protocol data units, with its bridge ID as the root. It says, I'm the root now. I won the election. And um, when the, that BPDU comes into switches A and B, remember C is sending that BPDU on all of its links, not every single one of these links. When it comes to switch uh, A and B, they first they increment a value in that packet called the path cost. So they add some cost to that path. And that the, the amount by which that value is incremented 
is based on the speed of the connection. So we have certain predetermined speeds and, and so that the path cost is incremented by that number depending on the speed. That allows us to take speed in account for these paths. We're going to ignore that for the rest of the tutorial. All these paths are going to be the same speed, but I'm just throwing that in there. So in this case, uh, because both switch A and B have two connections to the root, and they're receiving effectively the same BPDUs and path costs. Remember, two equal cost links, same speed. Um, the switch is actually, in this case, as its tiebreaker, going to use the lower interface number to be the root port. And all other connections to the root switch, root bridge, will be blocked. So we're trying to find the one designated, or the one, I shouldn't say designated, that's a special word, but the one root port, the best port to connect to the root bridge, root port to the root bridge. Let's continue on. So now all the other ports that are not the root port have been blocked. So port, ports two in this case. So two, two, this one and one on each port, one. So one port that has the best path to the root. But notice that we still have a topology loop in place. This path here through one, and, and these two links are open. We haven't dealt with those, so they're both open. And then all the way around here, back here. So you could still forward broadcast around and around and around and around. So let's fix that. So the next thing we're going to do uh, to close the connection between switch A and B is um, determine what the designated port will be. Um, in our case, the root bridge ID and the path, co path cost to the root bridge will be the same um, because all of the links are the same speed. We talked about that. These are all, say, gigabit links. So what we do here is there's a tiebreaker that's run into this segment. So we're find, trying to find the designated port that'll be open in this segment. That's what designated means. Um, so the tiebreaker will be the lowest sender bridge ID. And because there are two ports, two ports here, so the lowest sender bridge ID is AA. BB is higher than AA in this case. We're dealing, remember, with these two links, trying to figure out which ones of these we're going to block. And then the lowest port number because there's both three and four. Lowest bridge ID, lowest port number. So this port right here in the with the blue is called the designated port on this network segment, on this little little piece of little network connection right here between these two switches. And every other port, notice four here and three and four here are blocked. They're all shut off. There's only one designated port. So now the spanning tree loop that we've created is closed and there's exactly one valid path. So right around here, all these blue links here and through here between A and B. And then right here we're blocked. You see that right here we have an X. So this will not be an infinite loop around these three switches. It's just this one path with a block right here. And notice all of our extra ports are also blocked. They're also blocked, OK? We've disabled a lot of links, though. We're going to talk about that. Oh, and one other thing is notice that now the path between switch A and switch B is blocked, the direct path because we had to block this port right here to close our loop. So now if switch A wants to talk to switch B, it has to go through switch C. OK, it can't talk directly. So that's a little less efficient. Let's talk about reconvergence a little, a little bit. Um, S spanning tree is built to reconverge. So basically, reconverge means form a new topology around failed or disconnected links. So in this hypothetical, let's say this little link right here, remember, this link was active right there, and it fails. Okay. 
So let's say that link fails. Now, um, what failing means is because the port goes physically down, it will stop receiving BPDUs, the hello messages that it always receives. There's this, there's this hello message that gets sent by the root, hello, hello, hello at an interval. This switch is receiving, receiving those messages for a period of time, and all those timers is kind of beyond the scope of this video, but take my word for it. So stop receiving these messages and says, this path has failed. The good news is that this switch, switch A, is also receiving messages on this green link, even though the link is down. Remember, the link is blocked in this case, but but the switch is smart enough to know in order to allow spanning tree to work, it has to still receive BPDUs. It has to still receive BPDUs on this link, even though every other packet on this link is blocked. So only BPDUs can be sent across all links. The way we avoid the looping condition is that a VPU, BPDU isn't forwarded indefinitely. A switch receives the BPDU and just looks at it and then stops forwarding it, generates a new PB, BPDU and sends it to here. So there's not the infinite forwarding problem we have with BPDUs. But remember, it's kind of a digression, but all that to say that in, in every other case, this link would be down to normal network traffic. So we have another path through the root bridge here on port two, port one is down, another path. So we're gonna bring that path up after a waiting process. And we call these phases, there's, there's some different phases called listening and learning, and then it goes into forwarding. Again, a little bit out of scope, but there's a predetermined process for if this path fails, bring up another redundant path if it's unavailable. You can also see, by the way, in this diagram, and I don't have a slide for this, but if both of these had failed, switch A could have still used switch B to talk to switch C. So spanning tree could have reconverged in a different way to allow that communication through still. So spanning tree is smart like that. It's trying to allow the topology to survive failures of individual links. So now that we've seen a bit about how spanning tree works, we're going to go back to this two switch diagram very simple to illustrate a point and that is simply that we have four one gigabit links here now i i upped our link count we used to have two we now have four and this bridge is the root so we block three of the four links all right that's a bummer because we had four gigabits of capacity and we just shut off three of them that's kind of inefficient right I wonder if we can fix this issue. So let's talk about link aggregation. That leads us here. The solution to our problem here is to bundle multiple physical switch ports together into one logical switch port called an ether channel or a port channel or a link ag. Various vendors, you know, Cisco and Ocatel and Juniper and HP and Dell, they'll call them slightly different things. But for this presentation, we're going to use LinkEgg, kind of a generic term, not vendor proprietary or anything. A LinkEgg allows a pair of switches, um, and, and therein by spanning tree, the spanning tree protocol that's running between those switches, to treat multiple physical ports as one port, one logical port. And the good news is that the bandwidth of these physical ports can be combined. It can be aggregated. All right. More about that. So because we have four one gigabit links, we have four gigabits of bandwidth, like we said, available in our logical link. We have a uh, four gigabit link egg, we would say. And for different uh, manufacturers, that limit is different. You can maybe sometimes have eight connections in a link egg. That's common. It really just depends on the manufacturer of the switch. So let's say one link, uh, one link fails here. One link, physical link fails. So previously, with our, with our old example, um, we, had to, we had to shut down three links. And spanning tree would then reconverge 
around this failure and it would take some time and it would disrupt the network, kind of break things. But in our new configuration, because this is one logical link, I should have said earlier, that's represented by these little blue circles here. These are combined or aggregated. We don't have to have a spanning tree reconvergence. We don't have to go through that listening and learning process uh, because the logical link, this link aggregate, is still running. It's still up and running. And both of the, for both of these switch brains, they still think, wow, I, I have that link up and running. Now, the trick is that that link just got slower. It was a four gigabit per second link. And now we only have three gigabits per second available. So we lost a little bit of our capacity, but the logical link actually didn't go down, even though one of the physical links became unavailable. That's a really good thing. Real quick about um, the link ad configuration. Uh, it differs, you know, the commands that you run to configure a link egg differ on different types of switches. But the basic steps are you take the physical ports and you put in a membership command. So, so port 1 is a member of link egg 10. Port 2 is a member of link egg 10. So on and so forth. And there can be multiple link eggs configured on a switch. And then you can apply all the configuration. So the VLAN configuration descriptions, various things, um, whether or not the, the link ag is a trunk port or an access port, one VLAN or multiple VLANs. You apply all that configuration now to the link ag configuration instead of the physical port configuration. So you apply it to the link ag. Now in some switches like Cisco, the configuration when you apply it to the link ag actually trickles down to the physical ports. It, it pushes that configuration to the physical ports in some cases. Now the only um, pieces of configuration, and this may be a little bit of a digression, but where we don't do this is things that are specific to a physical port, like speed or duplex or unidirectional link detection, we, we still leave those applied to the physical switch ports. They wouldn't make any sense on the link egg because they're discussing the physical properties of that switch port. But all the other configuration, all the logical configuration is applied just to the link egg. That's typical, and most vendors have a different way of doing that, but that's it. One more thing. Let's talk about the Link Aggregation Control Protocol. LACP uh, is the abbreviation, is an IEEE standard that uh, makes link eggs easier to configure and more reliable. And it's, it's an open standard, so it's kind of one out. There used to be multiple standards that kind of competed against each other, and specifically different vendor proprietary standards before the IEEE came out with their standard. Uh, LACP is responsible for, number one, easing the configuration of a link egg and making sure the configuration at both member switches, remember switch A, switch B, one on each side of the link egg is correct. So there's always you know two switches involved in establishing this link. And number two, it, uh, LACP helps detect when a link fails even if that failure is not a physical failure. So what if there is a problem in which um, a, a, a link was still up, but it wasn't passing traffic? This could happen if you had some sort of a translational bridge device in the middle there, where maybe it went from fiber to copper in the mid middle of the span between the two switches, kind of an edge case, I realize. But, but something happens where the, the physical link is still up, but it's not able to pass traffic reliably. Well, because LACP sends little packets down each of these links, it can tell if those physical links are up or down and if they should still be part of the link egg or not, if they should be removed. And they can do it dynamically, which is really, really nice. All right, that's it for spanning tree and link eggs. Two important topics. Uh, spanning tree helps us make sure we don't have loops in our topology so we don't have broadcast loops sometimes people call them spanning tree loops but really they're broadcast loops broadcast or unknown unicast going around and around and then link eggs help improve the properties of our network and the convergence characteristics of our network so we can build better more reliable networks and overcome some of those spanning tree limitations so they're both used extensively all right thank you